do a quick introduction. So my name is Tony Sapienza. I have the pleasure of serving the university as an Associate Director of Marketing for CMU's online degree programs. Okay, I'll be a host today. Uh, joining me, we have a great panel. So one of those individuals is Dr. Troy Hicks. <clears throat> Dr. Hicks, is uh, he's a Program Director of our Master of Arts in Learning Design and Technology. He's also a professor in CMU's College uh, of Education and Human Services. So Troy, uh, welcome, and I, I appreciate you putting together this panel for us today. Uh, Troy's really going to help bring a, a great level of uh, expertise to uh, today's presentation. Thanks for having us here. Then another individual you may get to know sort of along the way is Katie Bowman. So uh, Katie's not joining us today, but <clears throat> she does serve the university as an assistant director of enrollment. Uh, Katie, you're going to find is a really great advocate that um, will be in your corner sort of along the way. So anything from helping you in registering from classes to really being a center or a central uh, go-to person should you have different questions sort of along the way. Uh, she plays that role exceptionally, exceptionally well. So I wanted to make sure I did put a name uh, and sort of a face to Katie, because uh, as you get into the program, you'll find that she's, again, one of those great advocates that's in your corner, kind of helps you uh, be successful, and it's one of those layers of support that we try to uh, wrap around you being the student in the program. In terms of an agenda today, uh, and Kayla, this is pretty loose. <clears throat> so as we have questions, if you want to either type those in or open up your line, um, feel free to do so. And it looks like we may have lost her. Gang? It's okay. This is that moment where we say, for those watching later, we appreciate any questions you may have. <laughs> That's by email. Right. So what I can do, um, let me just pause this here real quick. In terms of an agenda, uh, here's our agenda for today. I'll start off by giving you a, a brief overview of Central Michigan University, in case you're not that familiar with us. And then from there, fairly quickly, I'll kick things over to Troy uh, and the student perspective panel that he's put together. So that'll really give you some great in depth information on the program, um, any, anything from the cohort format to a large overview of the program and the courses within the program. It's going to continue with some aspects of uh, support st uh, services that we wrap around you to help make sure that you're successful in the program. That could include assistance with financial aid. And then towards the end of the program, we'll conclude with uh, the application admittance process and then conclude with some times for questions and answers. So I think that with that, let's go ahead and we'll, we'll kind of jump in. So Central Michigan University uh, was formed in 1892 as Central Michigan Normal School and Business Institute. <clears throat> that uh, passion for teaching and that, that DNA as we were originally formed as a teacher's uh, college, preparatory college, continues today. So within the quality of our education programs and the quality of the faculty uh, that, that teach in our programs, uh, you'll notice that, that that passion still is in the heart of CMU today. Our College of Education programs are accredited uh, by CAPE, and this uh, new program, the Master of Arts in Learning Design Technology, is close to receiving its certification and recognition uh, by ISTE. As far as a university as a whole, Central Michigan University is accredited by the North uh, Central Association of Colleges uh, and Schools. With CMU's global campus uh, in existence for nearly 50 years, delivering programs uh, at a distance. So those are going to be programs in an online format or satellite centers at nearly 26 uh, various locations throughout the country, and that's in, across 13 different states. You'll notice that as distance education provider, um, we do it quite well. Our library services are recognized as one of the top uh, services that we provide for students at a distance, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little more um, as we move through the presentation. So I wanted to just uh, highlight the aspect of CMU's delivery in the distance education uh, space, and that program and those educational opportunities that we create either through an online opportunity, as in this program, or through some of our satellite uh, opportunities throughout the, the region. 
So I think with that, Troy, I'm going to kick things over to you. I'll give you uh, control here, and you can tell us a little bit about the program and introduce uh, some of the folks that you brought along. Great. Thanks so much, Tony. And I will be really quick because we definitely want to get to our panel and engage with them and hear about their experiences in the program, what they're doing in their career. Uh, as Tony mentioned a few moments ago, we've recently revised the curriculum in our program, updated all the master course syllabi, and we are in the process of pursuing uh, ISTE, which is the International Society for Technology and Education, um, their recognition program for graduate uh, degrees. And so we have a 30 credit hour program, it's completely online. And then as you'll see today, we have alumni in a variety of career fields and they'll talk a little bit about what they do um, as learning designers and instructional coordinators and all kinds of different things that they're doing. And you can see from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that the expected job growth in this sector is about 11% over the next decade. Uh, and then also one other little piece of information uh, is that if you are a Michigan educator and you hold a valid teaching certificate, this program will also allow you to earn the NP or the Educational Technology Endorsement. And if you could go ahead, Tony, and hop to the next slide. Or, oh, I have control to do that now, too. Thanks so much. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Still getting my WebEx feed under me here. So. No problem. All right. So just a quick note about the typical experience here. Um, we know that uh, our students uh, are coming, many of them, straight out of a bachelor's degree. Some of them have been in their career field. They're coming from the K-12 sector historically, but we're also finding more and more people as some of whom you will meet today that are joining us from other industries as well. And so I'd like to introduce you to our panel and then we're going to get right to it and, and hear from them. Uh, we've got uh, three alumni of the program who are going to talk about what happened for them during their degree as well as what they're doing now. And so first I'd like to introduce Eric Whitmore. He's the Associate Director of Application Development at CMU and he is a leader on campus and in his field. So Welcome, Eric. Thanks for having me, Troy. Appreciate it. And second, a quick and brief introduction to Nicholas Provenzano, who is the Makerspace Director at University Liggett School. Uh, he is an award-winning educator and uh, is also known as the nerdy teacher. Uh, you might find him in a variety of spaces that way. And uh, welcome, Nicholas. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. And also today we have Misty Kitzel here, who is an educational analyst and e-learning designer, uh, does a lot with online learning, has worked in the healthcare sector as well as other sectors, and unfortunately doesn't have a webcam today, but uh, we'll have this image of you and we'll uh, maybe try to bring that back up while you're speaking later on. Welcome, Misty. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks. All right, so let's get right to it. So I, I had asked them to prepare and think a little bit about three questions um, that we could cover today. And of course, if anyone has questions, feel free to throw them in the chat uh, as well. And I'd like to hear each of you just delve in a little bit more deeply into your current work, your current role, and um, you can talk a little bit about how your experience in MA and Ed Tech, now learning design and technology, has influenced you and um, helped bring you to where you're at today. So who would like to begin? Should we go in order or somebody want to jump in right away? I can start. All right, thanks. Take it away. Yeah, um, I was part of the first cohort actually, uh, way, way, way back long time ago. I was actually, I submitted my uh, final proposal, my final project, as a matter of fact, when my wife went into labor uh, for my son. So it was a culminating um, day for me um, eight years ago, nine years ago. Um, it has um, been a great, I don't know, experience moving forward from that because I really felt prepared. Uh, but probably the best part of it was the cohort is just meeting different educators from all over and the different things they're doing and be able to talk and share and compare. Um, and so I've taken that from like I said, eight, eight years ago to improving my practice in the classroom uh, as an English teacher. And then most recently, these past two years now, as the makerspace director, 
at uh, University of Liggett School uh, here in Gross Point, Michigan. I coordinate so many different things, it's hard to even begin to, <laughs> to say where. Um, technology has changed in those eight years, but um, you know what I loved about the course was it wasn't about learning specific tools, it was learning about how to you know, take new different tools and put them into your uh, practice in a way that makes sense, that wasn't reliant on uh, a specific item. So uh, for me, uh, I, it was just such a great program to be able to do online um, that uh, made me really proud, you know, by the end of it to be a chip. And my wife, she actually graduated from uh, CMU, uh, you know, and also scored some points with her as well. <laughs> to say that I have my master's through uh, uh, Central Michigan, but it really was a great program there. I really felt prepared me moving forward to uh, explore different tech and the way it works in the classroom. Oh, that's great. I, I knew a little bit of your story, but I don't recall hearing the fact that you had graduated on the same day that uh, your wife went into labor and your child was born. So I'm, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for sharing that. Uh, how about we jump over to Eric? How, how about for you? What's your current role and uh, what has happened for you since you've been in the master's program? Yeah, thanks, Roy. Um, my current role is the Associate Director of Application Development for CMU. So I have a heavy IT background. Um, I originally, when I graduated with my undergrad from CMU, I uh, started a technology startup in logistics. And through a process of being bought out and wanting to stay in the area, I ended up as a software engineer at CMU um, in their global campus or online learning um, division. And really enjoyed my time doing that, but wanted to advance my career and um, found the EdTech program through some, um, um, through some coworkers of mine who really enjoyed the program themselves and also were able to explain um, just the benefits of understanding how we leverage technology in a higher ed setting. And so um, learning all these educational philosophies and technologies uh, allowed me to end up getting um, an opportunity to be promoted in my role and into more of a management position because I was able to use my master's education and my experience to really create innovative solutions for the university and help um, foster a, a, a learning environment. So my, my story is probably not your traditional story um, for, for this program, but definitely this program has helped me um, understand how to leverage technologies in a way that promotes learning. And, and I'll kind of talk more as we get into some of these other questions about some of the things that have come out of that. But I would say if you're in a leadership role at all, understanding how to teach people and using technology to do so is something paramount. Fantastic. Well, thank you. And we'll transition here quickly to Misty, and I'll put your uh, image back up on screen. So even though you can't join us on webcam today, everybody can get a sense of who you are. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about your current role and your experience in the program. Well, I'm actually a little bit different because I'm a consultant, so I go into a lot of different companies and help them with their e-learning and what they need also for marketing um, and educational training needs. So I actually started my Master's of Ed Tech and used my student projects in the portfolio to transition from my previous consulting world of web design and marketing into more e-learning. And I got into a major healthcare hospital chain for about four years, and I got my degree. And now, actually, it's it's kind of funny. Tonight I am meeting with two potential partners, and we're looking at launching our own e-learning company here in Grand Rapids. So some of the things that were really important for the courses for me, um, everything was really hands-on so that you actually had practical experience. That means a lot to me versus just only theoretical. So every class had something that was useful that I could actually apply in my professional life as I was learning it, and that was just absolutely phenomenal. The, the program was incredibly useful to me. Wow. Well, congratulations on the uh, new venture there. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. So, wonderful. I'm sure you'll hear about it ad nauseum later, Troy. <laughs> That's great. Misty is actually helping us uh, coordinate a potential uh, ed tech event later this summer. So, yes, I'm, I'm hoping that we will talk more soon. 
Let me go back to our overarching questions here. And, you know, I think one of the things that students are always curious about, potential students um, and current students, um, are hearing like what it was that was most valuable and, and reflecting on that, not only in the moment, but a, a semester, a year, two years, eight years, 10 years later, like I've asked each of you to kind of think about one particularly influential assignment. So something that uh, really stuck with you over the years. Uh, what did you do at that moment for that particular assignment? And then how has that made a difference for you as you progress forward? And uh, taken what you've learned and applied it in your current teaching and learning context. So uh, how about this time, uh, can we, let's go right back to Misty. Let's have you go ahead and start and maybe you can tell us about a particular assignment that you've been thinking about and that you found useful. Well, overall, I think all of the hands-on assignments were very useful for me. One that stands out in particular was actually using Audacity to create a podcast. Um, this sticks out because it was using an industry standard software, um, one of them anyway, because you have, we use Audacity, which is the free, a freeware software, where Adobe Audition is actually a paid version of right. software um, sound editing. But I think that was very useful because that was one of the skills closest to what I actually found when I got into the corporate environment of actually creating an entire piece that would be something that is a potential project that you would do in corporate. So that was really useful to me versus um, making like a poster for K through 12 because I come from the adult learning corporate side and not the K through 12 side. So that's why it was most important to me. Great. Do you remember the topic of your podcast by any chance? Educational technology. Oh, okay. So a podcast in an educational technology class broadly about educational technology. That's appropriate. Exactly. I had a couple of little segments talking about a couple of different upcoming issues in ed tech. Okay, great. All right, and um, maybe we can uh, transition over to Nicholas. Do you have a particular assignment that you found that was uh, really influential and even 10 years on, maybe uh, something that you've been thinking about? And trying yeah. To you know, through the class, that's where I started my blog, which became my website, theinternetteacher.com. So, um, and it's like part of that right around the same time, started my Twitter account. Um, like my very, very, very first post uh, for Africa, now it seems, uh, was like three or four sentences. And it was basically like, I'm creating this for my ed tech class. So we'll see where that goes from there. <laughs> and um, writing on my site has led to me uh, writing books and speaking all over. Uh, I mean, I've been lucky to uh, travel to Singapore. I was in Iceland this fall um, to do keynotes uh, all over. It's like just really cool. And, you know, it all started with a simple blog post that was like, eh, who knows what will what, happen for this class on this uh, website. So um, it was just good because it just helped me find my voice, which I think is important for any educator. Um, is to be able to share what it is you want to share and be able to speak uh, your mind clearly and, you know, be able to share your ideas. And then because of that, learn from others who are doing the same thing. That's amazing. I I always love hearing these blogging stories that go bigger and bigger and bigger. And yeah, for everyone, I just put the link to um, Nicholas's blog in the chat room there. And again, it's the nerdy teacher.com if you're watching or listening later. And I think, too, it's really important when we when we as a program are considering the ISTE standards and thinking about what it means for teachers to be collaborators and facilitators and communicators in the global world. Um, this is just an amazing example. So thanks for sharing that. And this actually, I don't know, Eric, if this is going to be on your top list here, but I know that connects a little bit to some of the things that you've done. Um, and then at some point here in the next few minutes, I'm hoping we can talk about the, the blog space. But what was one particularly influential assignment for you that's uh, carried you forward since you graduated? Just, what was that, about a year ago? A little over a year ago. Yeah, last uh, May of 18. So, yeah, just, uh, just over a year ago. And, yeah, I was just going to expand on what Misty said in that. The thing I really appreciated about this program was that it was more project-based instead of paper-based. Um, all of the class, almost all the classes really encouraged 
uh, using what we learned in a project format and then apply it to your professional life. So the things that I created in class, I still use. And one of those things that the program uses today um, was an ePortfolio solution to allow the, um, the master students to uh, showcase their workload, work through the uh, program. And so initially what, we, what I did was I, uh, my capstone project was to assess and create an ePortfolio solution for this purpose. And so we went through that. I went through that whole process of doing an assessment of the different technologies in the space and understanding um, the philosophies behind how to leverage it correctly. And then we set up a, um, a prototype and um, was able to work with the university leadership to help embed this in the, in the, the program. And it's been great to see that tool being leveraged to help students learn and increase the, their knowledge in the space and just grow as students. And, um, it's just really helped me understand the importance of leveraging these tools correctly to help people learn. Another, just to tag on to that, another uh, assignment that I really enjoyed was we, I, wrote, I did write a paper on computer adaptive testing. And so as a parent, I have students that participate in the NWEA testing, which is a form of computer adaptive testing. And writing that paper and, and going over those concepts in class really gave me a comfort level to how that works and why it's important and how it can be leveraged correctly. And so I really just appreciated from a personal standpoint being able to understand that and then see how it's being used in my students or in my children's classroom. So that was neat. Yeah, that's great. And so first of all, thank you again for that contribution to our program. I was going to share really quickly here just a, a sense of, of what that kind of looks like. Um, our students in the future are going to be able to create a WordPress blog um, and then even after they're done at CMU, they can take all this content and export it easily because it's a WordPress um, blog and then they can um, save that. But they'll be able to go in, we'll be able to um, add artifacts um, that they've written, create links out to other places. We're going to try to get things so you can go and sort through by the ISTE standards and things like that. So it's really uh, it's quite nice the way that you've set that up. And so thank you so much for doing that. And um, then, yeah, also that, that's great that you're carrying other assignments and things forward too. So wonderful. All right, I think we got to everybody. Everybody got got a chance to say something, right? Yep. All right. So we'll uh, maybe we'll we'll toss it right back to you, Eric, then for this this third and final piece, um, especially since you're in the IT industry and you're providing learning and professional development experiences for your colleagues. Uh, what's the advice that you have? What what is it you're thinking? What have you learned about instructional design or about adult learning theory or about educational technologies more broadly? I'd really be curious to hear what it is that you've carried forward with you and that you're applying in your day-to-day -day work. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll go back to what I said earlier. If you're in any kind of leadership role, you have a responsibility to teach and coach the people around you. And figuring out how to do that effectively is super important. And this course in this uh, program allows you to learn how to do that effectively with technology. And this program really gives you both a, a philosophical understanding of how to teach and these, using these teaching practices and methods, but also how to use technology in practical ways. And I found that extremely valuable because I oversee, shoot, at this point over 20 uh, software engineers and being able to onboard new employees and teach them the, the technical skills that they're going to need um, to be able to be successful in the roles that they're hired into. Um, all of that goes back to the things that I learned in, in the EdTech program and using the tools and techniques that I learned, um, even right down to doing job interviews. We use concepts from Bloom's taxonomy and other tools and matri different matrices um, as a part of the, the assessment process for going through and doing assessments on how people perform both in their job and both through the hiring process and all these tools and skills and technologies um, that I use today in trying to ma mature and coach my team, 
I learned in this program. So I'm forever thankful for being able to be able to participate. That's great. I really appreciate that focus on, you know, if you're in a leadership position, you are an educator. I, that that's that's a great takeaway. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, how about we transition over to Misty? Is there something that you have uh, carried forward with you and especially if you're getting ready to start potentially a new e-learning business, what are what are some things that you would uh, share with our audience as they're thinking about what it means to be a an instructional professional in, in a variety of settings? I would say don't just look at the content of the classes and the programs. Reach out and join different societies and um, groups all across the internet. LinkedIn is a great resource and has lots of groups for e e-learning designers and also users of specific software if you're in the corporate industry, such as the Lectora Users Group, the Articulate Users Group, Captivate, Rise, things like that. Those are all corporate e-learning software programs. And also there's like Training Network Magazine. Sign up for the free training magazines. Um, they offer one, and it has great articles that are always timely and relevant. And it always seemed to be that I would be working on a project for class, and I would get my free magazine. And lo and behold, there's at least one article in the magazine that is completely relevant to the project I was working on. So I would recommend doing that. And also go to conferences. There are such amazing conferences all over the place that there's so many sessions that are just so much fun and relevant, and also that you get to meet different people across different industries and that you can benchmark what other places are doing that you're not so that you kind of know like, hey, we're really ahead of the curve or, oh, wow, we look really kindergartner in what we're doing compared to what other places are doing. So branch out and just learn everything everywhere. Be a strategic lifelong learner. That's great. And I imagine that's a connection we can make to some things maybe Nicholas will talk about in conferences and professional organizations are super important. Um, and I appreciate you, Misty, kind of pushing me more to think about LinkedIn. I just put a link in our chat room to our newly formed EdTech at CMU LinkedIn group, which is open and available for anyone who might want to jump in, including people who are joining today. Um, our panel is they may stick around for the rest of the webinar, but they, they might also have to head out here pretty quickly, and we'll hear from Nicholas in a moment. But if anyone has any last questions you want to toss in the chat room and have the panelists um, answer directly, uh, please go ahead and do that. And uh, what are you taking away? Um, where, where are you at with all these uh, ideas and advice and things that you would share with other educators? Nicholas, what are you thinking? Hmm. Oh. You might be muted still, sir. There we go. Perfect. It's about um, making connections and sharing experiences. You you want to be comfortable just sharing your story because you never know who's out there that shares the same story, can connect to it, and then connections are made and you can grow as a uh, professional. That's sort of what I found over uh, 10 years or so of being involved in ed tech is that the more connections you make, the smarter you are, um, you know, because we're no longer living in a world where, you know, intelligence or answers is limited to a single person sitting somewhere alone. Um, when you have access to the internet and you use it, um, you are now connected to millions of people. So I never feel like I have a question. I can't be, it can't be answered by anyone. Um, so, sharing your story, being comfortable, putting yourself out there. I think those are tough things to do, but uh, things that are definitely invaluable. That's great. Yeah. And uh, to make that ISTE connection again, might might people be able to see you leading a presentation this summer in Philadelphia? Yes, I have uh, a few, three or four. All right. Something great. like that. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, I don't see any particular messages in the chat room, but actually I would like to maybe call on Tony. What what would you like to hear from these alums? And as you work in the e-learning space and you see so many different programs, is there anything that they've said that resonate for you before we let them go? They may stick around for the rest of our webinar. They may need to go as well, but is there anything that you're thinking about that uh, you might want to ask them? Sure. <laughs> I'm always curious. Um... Of course, learning at a distance, it has its 
um, unique, um, uh, how do I want to say it, um, so unique experiences. Was there any support services in particular that you found um, within the program or just CMU as a whole that really helped um, come behind you and provide an extra layer of uh, assistance kind of moving through the program? Uh, for me, it was just the cohort itself. It was, you know, having a group of people to connect with throughout the entire uh, two-year process. Um, that was so helpful. So I, I think whenever you got stuck, you were able to connect with anyone in your cohort to help you with any of those projects. That's great. This about, is Misty. Uh, hi, Misty. Um, I, hello. Um, I loved the global campus library services because I could just order anything I wanted and they could PDF me a version of it so I didn't have to drive two hours to physically go to a library campus. Um, I would really love it if those library services were available to alumni, hint, hint. Um, <laughs> but other than that, um, I, it was great because I could find something that I wanted or talk to the librarian and they would get it and they would send it and it was just really useful for writing the papers for the classes that I needed to do. Wonderful we hear. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can echo that. The library services were great, being able to do that remotely. You know, I'm on campus uh, during the day, but from home at night, being able to access those was, was tremendously helpful. Also, the, um, I, I forget what their actual title is, but the, student, the students, the other students that are part of CEDL that help to coordinate um, just the little things, like being able to put all the assignments, all the major assignments on my, in, in a calendar format that I could put into my calendar and, and just help, having them help me research some, um, you know, just some different little um, other services that the university offered and they knew how to access those was very helpful. So I really liked the, the student support service that CEDL provided. That's great. Yeah, those uh, online. Uh... On Alex. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, the online analogies were great. That's, that's great feedback, and I'm always curious. Um, and those are similar things that I generally hear. The cohorts are uh, that support network for sure, library services, and then just little things like assistance getting registered for classes. Where I've heard before just getting assignments put on calendars. It's just those little details can uh, go a long way. So thank you for that feedback. Yeah, it's always definitely, definitely good to hear. So. Thank you to the three of you. Certainly you are welcome to hang around for the last 15, 20 minutes of our webinar. I know Tony is going to talk through a few more aspects of the program and I'll be here to monitor the chat room and maybe chime in on uh, occasion. But uh, if the three of you need to go, we certainly understand and we appreciate again that you were able to spend a little bit of your afternoon with us. So thank you so much. Thanks, Troy. All right. You're very welcome. I'll get us back to the right slide here, uh, Tony, and uh, I don't know how to give you back control. In <laughs> All right, now let's see, I think, uh, so if you uh, go ahead and you click on my, right click on my name, then you can get change role two and put me back as presenter, there we go. There we go, yeah, Tony and I were joking earlier, I am much more a Zoom video conferencing person, and so uh, getting my feet wet with WebEx today. It's, <laughs> it's always fun when the ed tech person can look like they've still got something to learn, and in fact, we all do. So. That's, that, that is true. Well, uh, thanks, Troy, and we'll probably tag team these next two slides together. Um, we heard Nicholas talk a little bit about the cohort format. So what that really is, is you're starting a group um, with the same sort of core students and you start together and you sort of move through the program together. Um, this program is designed in a cohort format. So generally up to 25 students in a cohort, so, so a really nice intimate size. Um, I think that really came out in Nicholas's um, information that you really do get to know one another, you have that collegial bond. Uh, but then I also hear post-graduation, it's that network, that network of individuals that you, that, that you build. Um, Within, within that cohort and that sort of deep relationships that um, kind of develop along the way. So <clears throat> that's one aspect of this program. 
when we say in bullet two, the courses are conducted in compressed terms. That is meaning that um, we take a semester and we break a 16-week semester down into two eight weeks. So there's a, for example, there's a fall one term. There's also a fall two term. So over the course of a 16-week semester, you actually take uh, one course every eight weeks. So it's a great way to sort of move through the program at a, um, at a digestible rate uh, for a lot of folks that are balancing maybe work-life balance and then adding this <clears throat> into, their, um, into their schedules, that sort of compressed format, one course at a time, seems to be a, an, an ideal fit. And then we also say the courses are mostly uh, asynchronous, and Troy, maybe you add a little bit of color here, but uh, that basically gives you the flexibility to be able to um, conduct the work uh, based on your schedule. So perhaps that's an early morning uh, type of time frame while the family is, is still sleeping, other folks it may be later in the evening, um, but there's flexibility uh, to sort of arrange your schedule based on what's convenient and, and works for you. There may be some courses that you utilize a synchronous format. That would be something like this where we're all logged in together at the same time. Try to know if you have any um, additional color on either the cohort format or sort of the asynchronous or synchronous aspects of some of the classes. Yeah, I would say with the synchronous, asynchronous, you know, as faculty, we're very mindful that they are condensed and that people have busy lives. Uh, I don't think that there is any one of my faculty colleagues who, like, demands that you must be online from, say, 4.30 to 5.30 every Tuesday for eight weeks. A lot of us will do kind of a, a thing where we'll say we're going to be online, like, these points in the semester and do a Zoom or a WebEx. You need to join for two out of four of them, or you may um, join in live or you can watch the recording later. Uh, also, there are some small group projects or partner projects, and we just trust you to set up and synchronize in whatever way is appropriate for you. So, yeah, not in the master's program. There's not, to my knowledge, any one of my colleagues who are saying you must be online at this particular time. Okay, very good. So Troy, um, maybe we'll have you actually walk through some of the courses. Um, there's sort of this aspect of the required core, and then you've got some elective courses along the way. Um, and I'm just gonna flip through here a little bit and then I'll flip back. But um, I think there's a really nice mix that sort of hits the sweet spot for everybody. You heard Misty's sort of story. She's um, from more of a training and development aspect. And you know, there's courses that apply and I think definitely resonate there. If you're somebody more like Nicholas that's in that K-12 aspect, um, the program does a great job sort of bridging, I think, through the, through the courses that are available, sort of both spectrums there based on um, either career goals or where you're currently um, aligned. Yeah, and I would just piggyback on something I said earlier. We've recently revised the curriculum. We've narrowed down from 33 to 30 credits, which is helpful for some people with the financial aid situation, not having that one last semester with just three credits. You're, you're in a six credit semester and able to be fully eligible for financial aid. But also in terms of the curriculum, we looked and we tried to eliminate some redundancies. We listened to our alumni and um, yeah, so the 590, 653, 642, 643, those first two semesters, you're, you're getting introduced to a lot of different technologies, a lot of different learning theories, really building that cohort, um, learning kind of the, the fundamental knowledge about learning design and technology through these courses. And then when you move into the 700 level courses, um, well, and additionally the 662, I, I always feel like that should definitely be a little higher level master's class. That, that one's about big data, data literacy, figuring out how to use data in your classroom and in your context. Um, but then also just figuring with each of the 707, 708, 709, you're, you're then applying, you're moving and you're building even more of those projects and thinking about what um, good teaching and learning looks like in your particular context. So historically, we have been a K-12 program, but as we've had more and more adult education, higher education, corporate, nonprofit, military, other people that have been interested in online learning, um, we've tried to refine our curriculum. And all the instructors, and especially in 710, when you get to that capstone project, 
there's a lot of flexibility. So we want you creating projects that are going to be useful for you, whether you're working with little ones or whether you're working with adults, whether you're in a workplace, whether you're in a more traditional education setting, you're going to have a lot of flexibility through all those courses and through all those projects to design things that are going to be immediately useful for you and the learners that you teach. Oop, I'm going to go back. Oh, yeah, and then the electives, you can see we have a pretty wide range of electives um, that you're able to choose from, um, especially if you're a Michigan educator and you need to get that reading endorsement as well to move from provisional to professional. You can take those reading courses. Uh, we have a new media literacy course that I'm hoping to teach here with this cohort when they get started and there'll be a couple semesters in. But there are many other courses that you can take to complement um, whatever it is you need. Or you also see the independent study option. You can work with me as the program director and advisor to, to craft an independent study option as well. Okay, very good. So I think <clears throat> one thing um, that often comes up with this program being de delivered completely online uh, that we always like to call out is the diploma certainly reads Central Michigan University. Uh, while it's uh, delivered through CMU's global campus, per se, we're nothing more than a delivery arm. So Troy being housed in the College of Education and Human Services and being the program director, the program itself is, is right from the academic colleges. Um, we deliver it in an online format to uh, increase educational opportunities based on where folks are, are residing. So the diploma reads Central Michigan University. We are one university. Uh, we always like to point out that graduate level courses do require graduate level work. Uh, this is an advanced degree from a major university. I think what you're going to find, though, from our, our faculty, and, and perhaps you get that sense from Troy already, is uh, the faculty is very student-centric. So we realize that, um, you know, life happens occasionally along the way. Um, it's that communication loop and keeping your professors and your faculty uh, members, they're there to support you along the way as well, so keeping them apprised of situations. Uh, I found when I've talked to alumni and students has been um, just that relationship you can build can go a long way um, in that aspect. So we always like to say the professors, while they are demanding, they are also understanding. And then re sort of affirming Central Michigan University, we are ranked one of the most productive small research uh, universities in the nation. Try, I'm not sure if there's anything you want to add to that slide or um, additional color you'd like to provide. I just appreciate your kind words and would echo that, yes, I think that my colleagues are pretty flexible and understanding. We have many students who are, you know, two weeks in, four weeks in, six weeks into an eight-week semester, and then something, life happens, and we try to make accommodations as necessary. And Katie Bowman is absolutely outstanding in terms of being responsive to student needs as well. So you have a lot of support from faculty and also uh, support uh, with all the other aspects of your enrollment. Okay, absolutely. So, uh, technology, I'll provide kind of a high-level overview, but I think, Troy, from your perspective, um, getting that additional commentary will be great. Uh, so this is the learning management system that the university utilizes. Think of it as really your hub uh, of your, your core experience. So it's a place that you're going to go to upload assignments. Uh, there's a um, the ability to sort of collaborate in a, in a chat uh, feature uh, through different types of message boards with your, your cohort of students. Um, it's a place that you'll go and get assignments, and then you also can upload those assignments. What's great is it's, it's a nice organizational tool as well, so it really helps keep you sort of organized uh, the way the courses are laid out, and then um, even from the aspect of when you upload something, that, that date stamping and that time stamping just provides that additional layer of sort of organization. Um, Blackboard, Troy, anything you'd like to point out either from student perspective or teaching perspective? I'd just say every once in a while you're going to encounter one of our faculty who might push you outside of the normal Blackboard, but that's okay. As part of a learning design technology program, we would encourage people to do that and to think about things creatively too. But yeah, Blackboard does definitely serve as a hub for nearly all classes in terms of the content and the assignment and submission and those types of things. Okay, very good. WebEx or uh, Zoom, which actually the department the department utilizes, 
Um, think of it as a, a tool like this. So it's a tool that can be used in a collaborative session, presentations, the video aspect um, of it. Troy, you probably have a lot more different ways that uh, you utilize these types of technologies, as I would think, especially in this type of a class, as you're leveraging you know, e-learning, um, distance education. Yeah, I mean, like I said, most faculty do not require that you attend X number of sessions consecutively on this time and this day, but we all try to use Zoom or WebEx in creative ways. So, for instance, uh, when I teach 710 as a capstone project, I have an initial webinar, welcome, try to get as many people online as possible to meet one another, even though at that point they've known each other for quite a while, but just so I can get to know them. And then getting them in partners to be kind of an accountability partner for their final project. And then at the end of the semester, they use Zoom to uh, present their final project. And we set up a schedule. And if, if they're available, they, they log in and they can watch other projects. Of course, they could create a screencast as well. So yeah, again, people are pretty flexible in terms of how we use these tools. And, and we just want to let you know that there are humans on the other side of the computer. There are faculty. Um, and classmates that want to interact with you. Absolutely. <clears throat> and that again could include um, live video discussions, kind of like Troy had talked about. Um, from a support service standpoint, this was what, where I was sort of trying to learn a little bit more from our panel. Um, you know, I think as a university, this is an area that we really do uh, pride ourselves in. I always say we like to build kind of a circle of support around you. Uh, a couple of them got called out from our panel, so one of those being our library services. That is an award-winning library service. Um, materials are sent to you. It could be um, links that are sent to you. We have ref reference librarians uh, that can really help make your life a lot, a lot easier depending on what information you're looking for or research information. Uh, if it's a physical book, you know, they'll even go as far as mailing that to you with a self-addressed stamped envelope to make it more convenient in, in mailing it back. That always gets highlighted from um, some of our alumni as one of the one of those support services that really helped um, get, the, get, get them through the program. But additional support services could be textbooks, a, a system there in the service that um, they can mail them directly to your door. The Writing Center, I think, often comes up, especially as you move into writing at the graduate level. <clears throat> so depending on um, what additional sort of skills you may have to shore up in your writing, having that Writing Center there or a Math Center uh, always provides that, that nice um, support service. Central Link is our sort of online hub, so anything from paying bills to um, registering for classes, but we go a little step further there with Katie uh, assisting with that registration process. So we've got a lot of great support services behind the scenes um, that again sort of build that, that aspect around you to make, make you uh, more successful. Troy, I don't know if there's anything you want to add with the support services. I would say our, our, our library continues to grow their databases and online ebooks as well. So it's just a really incredible resource. And yes, I know many students have used the Writing Center services and greatly appreciate it. Okay. Additional services could be financial aid. So anything from, we've got, now Troy and I, we're, we are not the financial aid experts, uh, but we certainly have them at the university. So assistance with FAFSA, uh, if you're a veteran, thank you for your service, but you may have some ad additional uh, education benefits there. So we have a Veterans Resource Center to assist you in accessing those benefits. Perhaps you do receive uh, some type of tuition assistance through your employer. So we can assist you sort of with all these uh, layers of um, just the financial piece. You know, how do, how do we make the financial part of it a reality? And we've got experts in place to assist you with, with that process as well. Some important information. So because this is a cohort uh, program, we are currently on uh, the recruiting um, aspect for our fall uh, cohort starting in August. With that, we do have an application deadline of June 14th coming up here in just a matter of weeks. Again, those courses will start this coming August uh, 2019. This, this will be for the new Master of Arts in Learning Design and Technology. Uh, Troy did a fabulous job just sort of making some tweaks. Um, it really hits a nice, I think, sweet spot of the audiences, again, from K-12 
to a corporate training and development audience. Um, so I was really excited as the, as the marketing person behind this program on some of the new additions that uh, came to be. We do like to call out a couple different things. So one is uh, one aspect of what we call a seven-year rule. So graduate courses, they do have expiration dates. So the first course that you uh, end up taking, let's say in August of 2019, it does have a shelf life of seven years. Uh, past that seven-year threshold, uh, the credits will actually start to expire. Most folks, Troy, what, they're going to move through the program in about two years, 30 credits, probably about two years for completion, would you say? Yeah, we, we slimmed it down to five semesters, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if life did happen and you had to pop out of the, the cohort for whatever reason, you can always come back into it, uh, just keeping in mind that, that some of those courses do have a shelf life. Application process, it's, it's pretty simple. It's a $50 application fee, and then the program's at $637. Uh, per credit hour. Admission requirements, try and might kick this over to you. Um, it's pretty uh, straightforward. So no GMAT, GRE, uh, MAT, so no required entrance exams. Pretty standard with a 3.0 cumulative GPA from an accredited institution. Um, transcripts are always one of those aspects that some folks may delay on, so getting those transcripts from every school that you've attended. Anything you want to add on the admission aspects to the program? Uh, two quick things, you know, we do recommend that you're already in a training or educational capacity of some sort, but again, if you're a career changer, we welcome you. We, we'd be glad to have you. Uh, and then also to, you know, go back to that point that the case-by-case -case basis, and, Here's the person you get to talk to. So you would, you know, write a letter about uh, what it is that uh, your situation um, has happened. You know, for instance, I can, without divulging too much, I can share the story of one student who just started last year, um, didn't succeed as well as she would have liked in her undergraduate, um, but through one way or the other, found her way into the educational technology sector has been working in the sector for like 10 years and now wants to progress in her career. So she was a perfect fit. So even though her undergrad GPA was lower, uh, she had some work experience and, and was able to talk about that in her letter. We welcomed her to the program. So uh, lots of different options for people uh, in terms of getting in. If Don't let that GPA be a barrier either. We can, we can talk to you and work it out. Mm -hmm. I think that goes back to that student-centric aspect of our of our faculty. Um, okay, let's go on to the next slide here. Uh, when we share this um, presentation, we'll have some of this contact information. So again, that could be with student loans, veterans education benefits, um, again, assistance with any employers that you may have. So. We have that financial assistance and support services in place uh, to really make this part of a reality, a reality for you. Regarding the application process, it's pretty simple. So we do have uh, an online application. Uh, it's a simple enough at apply.cmich.edu. Again, for this program, we have a June 14th application deadline for the fall cohort. Um, most likely there'll be another cohort starting in the spring or January semester. So at a later date and time, uh, we'll have a, a revised application deadline for that particular cohort. Application fee is uh, $50. And then one area again where folks often delay their application is uh, the transcripts from other universities and other schools they've attended. So I always like to point that out and encourage you to get uh, those requests in as soon as possible. Yeah, I think with that, we can open things up. Should there be any additional questions uh, that come through, feel free to type those in the chat box there at, at your very um, far right. And then also I'm gonna flip through here to the last uh, slides. I hope you've gotten the perspective of um, the wealth of knowledge that Troy uh, brings to the table. He's, he's a great colleague to work with in marketing the program. Um, very student-centric, always willing to kind of come behind uh, me and lend me a helping hand. So try, I appreciate that, but I think that says a lot about sort of the caring nature that he has um, for his students and also for the, the program as a whole. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And 
glad that we're able to bring this program through an online environment and get it to as many students as possible with your support. And I know, I know we're supposed to be one CMU, but we still kind of refer to all of you in your office as global, and we appreciate the work that you do. So thank you sure. so much. Absolutely. <clears throat> so I think Troy and I, what we'll do is um, we'll sort of officially conclude the webinar. So thank you everyone for joining us today, but we're going to stay on the line here for a few extra minutes. So should anyone have any, any additional questions, then they can uh, type those in. We'll make sure that they get addressed. So thanks everyone for joining us tonight and uh, have a great night. Thank you.